So what we want to talk about today is the is information and how we can utilize small animal research tools in order to better understand the processes and treatments of inflammatory diseases. There's a long history uh, in the study of inflammation. It's in fact been recognized since ancient times and in Western medicine going back to essays by Celsus. They recognize that the process of inflammation uh, is really most commonly observed when you have a combination of pain, heat, swelling, and redness all together at a localized site. Now, when does this arise? It arises both in response to acute infections as well as to localized injury. Anyone who's ever been out playing a sport and sprained their ankle uh, really understands the, uh, the short-term results of these, this type of inflammation. Just because we've understood this problem for a very long time doesn't mean that it doesn't matter today. In fact, the role of inflammation is becoming a lot more important in a lot of the most challenging diseases that we face currently. For example, tumor, tumorigenesis and the ability of your body to fight the tumor is intricately tied to the immune response. Is some acute immune inflammation and reaction at this tumor site good to help suppress tumors? Probably. Is long-term chronic inflammation a bad thing for the body and inducing, this, and inducing a, uh, a, a state in the body that's more prone to developing tumors? Probably as well. So are there different pathways that are involved in these two processes? Or is it just a timing and dose issue? Those are some of the types of questions that people want to be able to study uh, with, the, with this, uh, these preclinical imaging systems. Another area that's critical for, uh, for re research is looking at autoimmune diseases. Now these include things like lupus and osteoarthritis. And people want to be able to better understand how to treat and mitigate the pain and suffering that these chronic disease, uh, that patients suffer during these chronic disease processes. With the Super Bowl coming up, uh, there is an, exa an example where sports injury and the response to both short-term sports injury and long-term sports injury is critical in an area of active uh, research in sports medicine. Now, there's been a lot of work over the past few decades studying uh, the inflammatory processes. The pathways I'll highlight here are really uh, the result of your infectious disease induction of inflammation. So, here you have uh, an example of a, uh, an immune cell that's tied to the innate immune system. And its response to things like bacterial LPS binding to the toll-like receptors uh, or yeast cell surfaces also binding uh, to the toll-like receptor pathways. This induces a whole host of internal bi biochemical responses which culminate in the production of of, in, of cytokines such as interferons as well as uh, TNF-alpha. That can then also set up a feed-forward mechanism where the TNF-alpha and uh, interleukin, interleukin uh, proteins activate the TNFRs and TLRs and start a signaling cascade that converges on IKK alpha and beta. Uh, those are phosphorylated and subsequently degraded uh, by, by the proteasome, which then uh, releases the transcription factors to go into the nucleus and continue to produce downstream effectors, including uh, other cytokines. So this is one of the, the real fundamental problems of, of studying inflammation both in v ex vivo and in vivo, which is that you're looking at mechanisms of action that include both feed forward and feedback mechanisms, and in fact likely uh, have cycling signaling cascades along with them. All of that complexity aside, there's already been a lot of work on developing drugs and therapeutics to treat these both acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. 
the, there's really a couple of two broad categories you have here, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and not surprisingly, the steroidal anti-inflammatories. Many people uh, have taken topical hydrocortisone whenever they have an itch uh, due to a bug bite or a poison ivy. There's also prednisone, uh, both oral and inhaled, for other chronic inflammatory diseases like, um, like for example, uh, asthma. Anyone who's had a headache has taken a small molecule NSAID. The oldest of these uh, being acetosalicylic acid uh, or aspirin, which was first described as a willow bark extract by uh, Hippocrates. So again, this, this disease process of inflammation has been around for a long time. And in fact, there are some treatments that also go back thousands of years that we still use today. Of course, there are other substitutes for that now, such as ibuprofen and acetaminophen. For other diseases, particularly diseases like uh, osteoarthritis or chronic arthritis, drug companies are spending a lot of money to go after multi-billion dollar markets uh, with things like Humira and Embro. These, uh, Humira, for example, targets uh, by sequestering TNF-alpha away from the TNF-alpha receptor, breaking that feed forward uh, feedback loop in the inflammatory disease process. So now let's get to the crux of what we want to talk about today, which is how can in vivo imaging, in particular in vivo molecular imaging, help with studying the disease processes involved in inflammation as well as the development of new anti-inflammatory or perhaps uh, subtly pro-inflammatory drugs, especially at the site of tumor genesis. Well, it can help in a wide variety of ways. One of the most basics is just to help track the myriad of cells that are involved in the inflammatory process. You can label uh, T cells, and we'll give an example later of labeling macrophages with near IR dyes in order to track where they go around the body during an immune response. You can also study effectors of the pathway, uh, particularly by looking at activatable optical probes or image downstream effects and effectors. What's nice about in vivo imaging is that this is non-invasive technology. So you can conduct time course studies of cohorts of animals, that, for example, looking at different genetic backgrounds. Perhaps you want to look at a TNF receptor knockout mouse versus a normal. You might want to look at how new drugs compare to, to the old standby NSAIDs or looking at combination therapy or new ways to package those drugs into novel, uh, into novel nanoparticles and see if they can improve the efficacy of these old standbys. Or you might want to study the effects of diet on the inflammatory process. If you've looked at uh, APOE knockout mice before and put them on high fat diets. Not only do they get fat, there's obvious induction of broad spectrum inflammatory processes in these, uh, in these mice. Hairstream molecular imaging offers really a suite of systems that can help researchers study these processes. This includes everything from our classic benchtop model, the Invivo MSFX Pro, to our new imaging platform, the Invivo Extreme. The Invivo Extreme Stream comes in two different configurations. One is our high resolution front illuminated model, which can then be upgraded to our back thin back illuminated model, or you can start with the back thin back illuminated model. It's really up to you. Really what you get between the front illuminated and the back illuminated models are increases in luminescence sensitivity. So let's take our first example as a way of looking at how researchers can track <coughs> and study the development of novel nanoparticles or novel ways to, to encapsulate already approved and already standard therapeutics into new ways that might improve therapeutic outcome. So if you look at uh, Capini et al., they were interested in packaging up liposomes in the presence of curcumin, and other, uh, and other small molecules that are known to be anti-inflammatories, and they wanted to see if packaging these things up in liposomes would help improve outcome by driving those drugs to the site of inflammatory injury. 
So in order to do that, they labeled those liposomes with DIR and then injected them into mice that were either that had one side that was uh, had an inflammatory lesion and another negative control side, as well as imaging a non-DIR labeled mouse to control for autofluorescence. Always a good idea, even when you're working in the near infrared. Now, as you can see from this experiment, the liposomes, not shockingly enough, mostly accumulated in the liver. But what's really nice is that you see, in fact, the preferential targeting of these liposomes to the site of active inflammation. And this is probably due to the liposomes being uh, essentially eaten by macrophages and other um, endocytic innate immune cells, which are then trafficked to the site. So that's great news. Not only is it getting to the site, but it's getting to the site preferentially versus the other leg, and does it, in fact, improve the outcome. And whenever you look at liposomes that have a combination of drugs, they definitely have an improved clinical score versus controls or just the drugs alone. Using a similar strategy, we can also look at and study the actual immune cells themselves. In this case, these researchers wanted to see if they could utilize uh, DIR to label macrophages and then track them to sites of acute inflammation. So if you look here at, the, uh, at these animals, they are able to quite nicely track the site of inflammation, which on, in this case is on the left, versus a control on the right. So here, rather than looking at a drug and tracking where it goes with new infrared fluorescence, we're actually tracking the cells themselves. We developed a nice optimal labeling protocol where you add two microliters of DIR to about 10 to the fifth cells, then inject these IV into the animal uh, at around 10 to the sixth per animal. You can then, of course, using non-invasive fluorescence imaging, uh, serially image these animals over time and then quantify the signal-to-noise ratio over time with the inflamed versus the non-inflamed. And to the naked eye, you can already see that there's a significant induction, particularly early on at 48 hours, uh, of the localization of these macrophages to the localized site of inflammation uh, versus the control palette that didn't have LPS. What's nice about whole body and vivo imaging is that you can also see where the cells are going throughout the rest of the body at the same time. So in this case, they went to the expected sites, but you might have the opportunity to observe your cells tracking to some sort of site you weren't expecting and use that information uh, to make a new discovery, which is really the most exciting thing you can do with these types of whole body animal engines. Another area of active study is looking at the induction of arthritis and how can we study the arthritic response. But one way is to look at, again, the localized uh, induction of inflammation. In this case, this group utilized um, antibodies to e-selectin. Now, e-selectin is upregulated si on endothelial cells at the site of inflammation. This makes it a really nice imaging target because, it's, A, the target is being presented toward the vasculature, and, B, it's selective uh, for, for inflammation. So, this, the Tumor, the imaging agent doesn't have to cross any barriers in order to find and bind to its target. So in this case, they induced arthritis with bovine collagen. They then treated these animals with both individual and combination therapies on, on several different days subsequently. Finally, they in, injected these mice with near IR4 for labeled anti-e-selecting antibody and then imaged them eight hours post-injection. And as you can see from the uh, what you see here, PBS, in this case, you're looking at the drug treatment group for the animal. So uh, mock treated animal, IP with RB200, IP with Interocept, or uh, combination therapy, and finally a good imaging control, which is a non-arthritic induced um, animal, to show both the residual autofluorescence as well as any residual non-cleared uh, anti-e-selecting antibody at this time point. And what you can see quite nicely is that with this type of imaging uh, study, 
you can see that both the both the swelling of the paw, looking at the area of this paw in both x-ray and fluorescence, as well as the amount of induced e-selectin has been significantly decreased with the combination therapy versus either of the two alone. In addition, if you're studying arthritis and you don't have access to near-IR labeled anti-e-selectin antibodies, there's a very cost-effective solution to looking at arthritis, and that is imaging with ICG. ICG, or endocyanin green, is available from a wide variety of vendors at a fairly low price. And whenever you inject, um, inject ICG intravenously, at these sites of inflammation, you have swelling. That's the leakage of, these, of the vasculature around these sites. Well, the ICG also leaks out of the vasculature in these sites. And you can see this accumulation of ICG at the site using a near-infrared imaging, uh, imaging system, and then co-register it with an x-ray to see if you can visualize any damage or changes to the bone structure at that site as well. So this group, in fact, uh, proved this quite nicely in this paper in uh, arthritis and rheumatism. and showed that the, really the peak imaging time at both the ankle and knee of rats is right around 10 minutes. So while having these time courses uh, is nice, really for subsequent researchers you can focus on the 10-minute time point, giving the best signal-to-noise ratio. You can also see that these types of studies are very precise and would enable you to separate out controls versus experimentals, whether you're talking about drugs or genetic backgrounds quite easily. They then, of course, went on to confirm by histology that in a normal knee, you don't see uh, a lot of immune cell infiltration, but in their models, you see uh, massive swelling and, and infiltration of immune cells. Another area that was published on uh, a while back uh, in this case, was looking at acute inflammation and really honing in on myeloperoxidase. And myeloperoxidase is present at the site of activated neutrophils and macrophages. And these researchers in Nature Medicine wanted to understand uh, whether luminol, which everyone has used in some form or another in Western blots, if you've been doing molecular biology at all recently, could be used in vivo to selectively target uh, the activation of myeloperoxidase. And by comparing uh, induced acute inflammation uh, in myeloperoxidase positive mice versus myeloperoxidase minus mice, they were able to nicely show that, in fact, uh, that injecting and imaging with luminol uh, allowed you to selectively image this really important enzyme and mediator of inflammation. With our new in vivo extreme system, <clears throat> you can now image these same uh, low light processes from luminol that previously were only available to systems that either did not have x-ray or had very low resolution x-ray. Now with the in vivo extreme, you can image low light processes like luminol inflammation and co-register it not only with uh, high resolution reflectant images, but also with high resolution x-ray images and co-register uh, this luminol activity with near-infrared fluorescence. In this case, we're looking at uh, topical induced inflammation responses and imaging these, those, these over time. Now, as you can see, the induced inflammation isn't just at the site of the redness and swelling. In fact, sometimes it is directly at the site, but other times you can see locally involved lymph nodes that are lighting up as well. And this shows the importance of having a high sensitivity, high resolution system so that you can make out the lymph nodes on the body using luminescent probes like luminol. And then being able to co-register these with x-ray in order to better landmark these with different parts of the anatomy so that if your mouse moves around over time, you have a really nice internal landmark to show where these luminescent signals are really coming from. So that was a fairly uh, nice proof of concept and this really could be an important 
model for people looking at wound repair. But there's other more interesting models that we might want to look at. In this case, um, looking at brain lesions is a growing important area as uh, highlighted at neuroscience last year. In this case, we're using a frontal lobe cryolesion model where uh, a block of metal is pooled and then used to induce a lesion by uh, touching into the skull of a mouse. We wanted to then image simultaneously using luminescence mode the active activity of the myeloperoxidase as a surrogate marker for inflammation or neutrophil response, as well as at the same time in the same animals, look at cell death using immune infrared fluorescent probe. Now this is an important, the ability to separate these two pathways is very important because oftentimes we want to be able to show that not only can we control the inflammation, but we want to be able to show that we can control and mitigate the damage to these tissues as well. And in the case of the in vivo extreme, you can nicely do this as well as landmarking it to different parts of the skull using our high resolution x-ray. So here's an example of looking at three mice and taking an x-ray, a luminescence image, and a near infrared fluorescence image, and then co-registering all three of those. You see the cryolesion in the brain quite nicely, but also other areas of whole body inflammation. Why might that be? Well, in molecular biology, sometimes we get what we ask for. Again, luminol is present at the site of inflammation, and mice, particularly male mice, sometimes will fight each other. So you have to be very careful and have many uh, multiple cohorts of animals in the groups so that you know what you're looking at. And we're also able to nicely image through the skull to not only to the uh, areas of damage using the infrared fluorescent probe, PSB-794. Of course, this can all be co-registered and overlaid, and again, you've got the x-ray to help you localize this damage uh, to the different uh, brain plates if you want. You can see you can nicely make out the different suture points on the heads of these mice. At a time, you can, of course, also conduct these studies longitudinally. Previously, uh, this, and now we're looking at a 20-hour post-injury time point. Here you can see the whole body luminescence has dropped off, but you can still nicely see significant myeloperoxidase activity at the cryolesion site, as well as, of course, still the uh, brain injury uh, due to the PSU-794. And again, this can be co-registered and imaged. So in conclusion, really people are just scratching the surface now of how you can utilize uh, in vivo molecular imaging systems to not only track cells but study the parts of the pathway, upstream and downstream effectors, such as e-selectin or myeloperoxidase. And to support this, CareStream offers both the in vivo extreme and our benchtop model, the in vivo MSFX Pro. So in conclusion, <coughs> inflammation is really a key area under study for presenting, for preventing and treating a lot of different diseases. Everything from sports injury to tumors to cardiovascular disease um, to chronic uh, pain and uh, chronic inflammatory diseases like arthritis and lupus. There are already a lot of different probes out there that can be used to image these pathways or see how your drugs uh, or novel therapeutics might modify these pathways. And finally, the best part about in vivo imaging, again, is that it's, it's not invasive and longitudinal. So you can study both in space and in time how new therapeutics or how different genetic backgrounds modify these inflammatory pathways. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and we'll be glad to take any questions.